I am humbled to be standing before you this evening, as surprised as some of you may be as well. Uh, God, in his mysterious providence, has uh, allowed for Gary to get COVID and uh, for me to be speaking to you. But I do pray uh, that the Lord would bless us as we come to consider him speak to us from Lamentations chapter 3. So if you've lost your place, uh, please do turn back to that text. And uh, let me just pray uh, that the Lord would help us as we study together. Let's pray. God of the covenant, mighty King of heaven, we do pray that you would come down and speak to us through your words this evening, uh, that you would be pleased to bless these words to our hearts and enable us to put them into practice. Oh, Father, we do pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to listen and hearts and minds to be responsive to the wonderful things that are found in your law. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. At the opening of a new year, and uh, on the back of one like the one that has recently passed, uh, Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 22 to 23 is, for the believer, a ray of hope that cuts through the darkness. Uh, Here, in this comforting chorus of confession, uh, we find a faithful God uh, standing in the midst of the mess of life. And tonight my aim is quite simple. It is to, just to get your eyes onto him, to guide us to Christ, to give us some perspective, a, a perspective which will not necessarily pull us away from suffering, but will give us the ability to not surrender uh, the hope that is to be found exclusively uh, in the Lord. But before that, Uh, Before we come to this great confession, I want you to have a think of some of those uh, difficult seasons of your life to date. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, it's not a case of of looking back because I'm living it. The uh, present struggles, the, the trials that you are enduring at this moment are enough to say, well, now is the time. Maybe uh, these past two years, you look back at at the tumultuous uh, time that we have all been living through, and you say, well, this has turned my life upside down. Uh, We're now living in a different world to the one that we left behind. And uh, we're facing what are, for us, unprecedented problems uh, in the ministry. We're facing challenges that... That never got covered for us at seminary. We're facing decisions that we never spoke about with our other half before uh, we entered into uh, pastoral ministry or church work as a whole. And yet, uh, what has been for most of us a time of, of radical change and trouble, what we find here is really that the the worst may be yet to come. If you have not suffered. And if you are not suffering, then you can guarantee it's the inevitable fact of life that you will suffer. A little while ago, I came across a story of an explorer named Bartholomew Diaz, who uh, in 1488 became uh, the very first to safely navigate a dangerous point on the southern coast of Africa. Uh, For many years, nobody knew what lay beyond that cape. No ship attempting to pass that point had ever returned to tell the tale. But in spite of near death, uh, this man managed to make it out alive. And to reflect the nature of the journey, he named the cape uh, Cabo Tormentoso, which means the Cape of Storms. But a century later, and that cape was renamed. Uh, It was renamed, as it is known today, the Cape of Good Hope, uh, because of the trade route into India that this cape would provide. Yes, it was a a, a wild and a stormy coast, and yet beyond it lay a calm and a quiet sea. And this really is for us a a picture of life. Uh, Life can sometimes feel like a cape of storms, but with Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storms. We can see life as a cape of good hope. And that is really the sense and substance of what I would like us to consider this evening from uh, Lamentations chapter 3, a chapter that provides us with perspective. It doesn't sugarcoat suffering. It doesn't teach us to exercise the power of positive thinking. 
It doesn't tell us to get a big fake smile upon our face and to walk around pretending that problems don't exist. But it faces up to reality, does it not? In fact, the very title of the book is, uh, is an honest summary of what is contained within it. This is the book of Lamentations. And you know, don't you already, that to lament is twofold. It is, on the one hand, to cry aloud and to mourn over the effects of sin in the world. But on the other, it is to simultaneously trust in the Lord. That is what it means to lament. And these are not mutually exclusive, are they? But they're two sides of the same coin. And uh, all the way through uh, the Old Testament, you see that lamenting just seems to be uh, the characteristic posture of the Old Testament saints as they, as they waited for the consolation of Israel, as they waited for this coming Messiah. They lamented so often. And by way of context, the speaker here in this chapter, who is uh, most likely to be Jeremiah, is lamenting in the aftermath of the defeat of the holy city Jerusalem, and the exile of Judah in 587 BC. This is the lowest point in the history of the Old Covenant community. They are in Babylonian captivity. And their sufferings are described for us here, uh, not in terms of the nation as a whole, but a single individual. Instead of getting that wide-angle lens, we are zoomed in on one man whose speech represents the rest of the people. And here, Jeremiah, who is also known to us as the weeping prophet, now seems to sit in the ashes of the ruined city. And as one preacher put it, he basically sings the blues. The book of Lamentations is uh, made up of five funeral poems. But here in this third poem, Jeremiah combines tragedy with triumph. He blends hurts with hope. He brings us face to face with the hardships and the heartbreaks of life. And he places them simultaneously side by side with the great faithfulness of God. Uh, Where do we usually get the punchline? Well, it is at the end, isn't it? It is the final note. And yet, that is not the case with much of the Old Testament. In Hebrew poetry, many of you will know that it is actually uh, in the middle where we get the punchline. And here, this is no exception. As we move into Lamentations chapter 3, you'll notice that it is the middle of the book, but also in the middle of the chapter, that we find the treasure. We find the hope for people in difficulty. And although echoes of doom and gloom seem to reverberate uh, throughout the book of Lamentations, here is a glimpse of hope along the way. And if you've been there, well, you'll know that to be true, won't you? That though there are moments of, of sweet relief that seem to break up the silence of suffering, sometimes those moments seem, or very often, few and far between. Uh, and this book ex- exemplifies that for us, for those who suffer Uh, There are highs and there are lows. There are times when God feels very near to us, but very often there are times when he feels so far away. And yet right at the halfway line, in the midst of this trial, here in chapter 3, we find a contrast, don't we? Between the tears of the world and the tears of a true believer. That's who we see here. But as I say, before we call to mind this exceedingly hopeful confession, I want us to step back and acknowledge in verses 1 through 18 this seemingly hopeless complaint. This hopeless complaint. It might seem very appropriate for us, especially uh, as we are at the dawn of a new year. To just skip right over to verses uh, 22 and following, to just jump right in and to sing, great is your faithfulness. But I want us firstly to hold off. And I want us to see the context that sits behind this great statement. What is it that prompts such a declaration from this man of God? Because you know, uh, before we see a man who has endured suffering, uh, experienced God's faithfulness, we see a man who has endured suffering. The storms of life. And nobody could deny that there's, there's really nothing low-key 
about Jeremiah's complaint, is there? He doesn't uh, play down, he doesn't minimize his sufferings, but in verse 1, he begins with transparency and clarity. Notice, I am the man who has seen affliction. This is not an observational, but this is an experiential statement. This is my story. I am the man. This is autobiographical, isn't it? Jeremiah's life seems to have gone from bad to worse. And the way he feels, well, it cannot be condensed to just one single line. But he takes time, doesn't he, to spell it out. He could have finished that I have seen affliction and quickly transitioned into, but God is faithful, but he doesn't. He gives us the details. He, he gives us this comprehensive summary of all of the ways that he has been on the receiving end of suffering. And what we have here, all the way down to verse 18, is a sustained series of cries, haven't we? A catalogue of miseries, mentally, physically, spiritually. This man has been shaken, and a dark cloud of depression hangs over his head. He's in a period that the Puritans referred to as uh, the darkness of the soul. You trace the theme all the way down the page with me. Follow with me from verses 1 through 18. Verse 1, I'm under the rod of his wrath. It's quite different, isn't it, from Psalm 23, where uh, the rod of the shepherd brings comfort to the sheep. But here we find that the rod is is really an instrument of pain in this man's life. But it gets worse. Verse 2, I'm walking in darkness. Verse 3, I get the back of God's hand. Verse 4, my flesh is wasting and my bones are broken. Verse 5, I'm sieged and surrounded. Verse 7, I'm, I'm, I'm hedged in and trapped. My chains are heavy. Verse 8, my prayers are blanked. Verse 9, my ways are blocked and my paths are crooked. Verse 10, I'm ambushed by a waiting bear and a crouching lion. Verse 11, I'm torn to pieces. Verse 12, I'm a walking target to God's arrows. Verse 14, I'm mocked and I'm taunted by my enemies. Verse 15, I am made to drink a cup of wormwood, which would have been an acidic drink that would have left a bitter aftertaste in the mouth. Verse 16, my teeth grind on gravel. I'm covered in ashes. Verse 17, I have no peace and no prosperity. And then after using a variety of expressions to really get his point across, here is the bottom line in verse 18. I am devoid of strength and absent of hope. God chose to include this in the Bible. These verses, as much as we uh, may like them to be, they're not typos, they're not misprints. We can't shrug them off or brush them under the carpet. We can't airbrush them out. But all scripture is God-breathed. And this is a divinely inspired passage. And for some, that feels slightly uncomfortable. But I'm sure for others who are here this evening, you take great consolation, great comfort. Why? Because your present experience may look tonight something like the sufferings that are listed in this passage. You see, the prophet Jeremiah is not bottling up his issues, is he? But rather, he's, he's giving us a window into his heart. This is a very un-British thing to do, isn't it? There's no stiff upper lip. Uh, culturally, we, we don't do very well in this country. My wife likes to remind me very often at uh, showing our weaknesses But here is a man who is is not afraid to cry, a man who is not afraid to show his tears. And I, I believe that one of the major applications of the entire book of Lamentations is to simply say to people like us in a fallen world like this, that at times it is right and it is appropriate to come before God and to offload and to say, I am hurting. This chapter allows us to to vocalize the reality of pain. And I wonder, is that something you struggle with, brothers and sisters? Is this something that you, you, you struggle to do? Do you, do you like to, to keep up the appearances? Do you like to, to give off this impression that you're all put together and you never uh, struggle? Well, uh, we must take notes, mustn't we? 
We must be transparent. We must be willing to share our burdens. We must never suffer in silence. But notice how how Jeremiah singles out God, not the Babylonians, but God as the reason for his affliction. It's not only my enemies, but it is the heat of the anger of God. God does not feel like a friend to this man. But all the way through, have a look at the opening words of many of these verses. The finger is pointed to God. He has done this. Look at verse 8. Even when I cry and when I shout, he he shuts out my prayer. This is supposed to be uh, the prayer answering God, but the, the door to his throne room seems closed. This is my refuge. This is my help. This is my security. But he's a bear and he's lying in wait. He's a lion and he's torn me to pieces. These are graphic pictures, aren't they? Where's the mercy? Where's the grace? And I believe that the whole point, and you know this, that the exile of Judah was as a result of their unrepentant sin and idolatry. This was self-inflicted discipline. Don't for a moment think that I'm equating all kinds of suffering as the result of your personal sin. No, you think of Job. Uh, the most righteous man on the face of the earth at that time, and yet by God's permission becomes the victim of the most severe kinds of satanic attacks. But that is not the case for the people of Judah. They are being chastened and disciplined by God. And as Jeremiah, who is part of that community, faces the, 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 the sufferings of the present time, well, it feels as though the light at the end of the tunnel has been switched off. And everything is black you know, throughout the Bible, God's hand is often used as a, as a metaphor for his rescuing power. Like when uh, God delivered the people of Israel from captivity in Egypt by his hand. And yet here we find in this passage that God's hand is repeatedly against his people. Instead of liberating him, Jeremiah feels imprisoned by God. And you can just, you can just sense, can't you, the 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 panic in his voice as he writes these words. And I must ask you, I wonder, does his honesty strike any chord in your heart and experience at the beginning of a year on the back of the ones that we've just experienced? Has there been something over, over the past two years particularly that has made you feel, perhaps wrongly or rightly wrongly, uh, that God is against you? Do you feel that way? Well, though Jeremiah feels battered and bruised, we can say that he is not alone. Uh, Most of the Psalms are are punctuated with pain. Most of the New Testament epistles were were written in prisons. Most of the great uh, church history giants were men and women who had to pass through fire. You pick up your church history books and you, uh, you, you read through our, our great heritage and you see that there's no shortage of of cases and examples of men and women who went through such experiences. You see, pain is to be expected, isn't it? It is invariably a a shared experience. And the gospel that we profess is is not one of earthly prosperity, but of uh, sometimes gut-wrenching suffering for the sake of Christ. Jesus was explicit. If any man come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And yet Lamentations doesn't teach us that if you are undergoing pain, well, you should just shrug your shoulders and live with it. That's not the application. And as a Christian, we uh, don't go around telling everybody to just have a a more optimistic view of life or to always look on the bright side or even worse, to to just man up. Now, Christians are not ostriches. We, We don't bury our heads in the sand, but we acknowledge that hurt is real and there is a place for lamenting in the Christian life. I, I love the fact that the shortest verse in our English translations, is simply Jesus wept as he stood at the graveside of his dear friend Lazarus, as he saw the destructive effects of sin in the world, or later as he weighed up the cost of the cross and the agony of Calvary in the garden, and he said, Father, let this cup pass from me if it be possible. And we learn from these examples that the really proper lamenting is Christ-like, isn't it? 
It's a Christ-like response. And and that's what we're seeing here in the first half of uh, Lamentations 3. Jeremiah, the man who has seen affliction, has poured out his heart to God in lament. All of his hope seems shattered. But then verse 21. This is where the passage hinges. As we move secondly from the hopeless complaints to a hopeful confession. All Jeremiah could see uh, was the cape of storms, but then his perspective changes in verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The heartbeat of Lamentations is encapsulated in these two verses they are the climactic point of the book we've trekked through some valleys but now we finally reached the summit and and what a view we have here as Jeremiah essentially displays for us the beautiful landscape of God's goodness against the dark backdrop of our sufferings John Calvin famously said that it is in the darkness of our miseries that the grace of God shines the more brightly. And that's what we see here, don't we? Verse 21 really refers to the thought process of the minds. Jeremiah has moved from introspection, from self-analysis to God, and his lament has turned to hope. Our passage seemed nothing short of hopeless, did it? And yet, there's one of those famous but moments, this key change But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. When life leaves you feeling discouraged and downcast and depressed, call to mind the promises of Scripture. Don't listen to yourself, but talk to yourself. Meditate. Bring the Word of God into your mind and before your eyes. Meditate on Scripture. And the three truths that follow, well, they tell us something, don't they, about the the character of God. We call to mind the steadfast love and the mercies and the faithfulness of the Lord. This is the diamond in the rough. This is the rose among the thorns. Jeremiah's situation, his present sufferings have not been taken from him. He is still there in captivity. He's not yet been liberated from exile or from the storms of life. And yet cognitively, in his mind, he's in that cape of good hope. His whole perspective has shifted and his eyes are lifted from his pitiful condition. And he sees nothing but the great faithfulness of God. This is the turning point. And the quotation of Psalm 30 verse 5 really seems to fit the theme of the chapter. A weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. The story is told of a father who took his son to a town parade, but his son was very sad because he couldn't see what was going on in the streets because of the large crowds. And so the father looked down at his teary-eyed son and scooped him up onto his shoulders. And there from his new seats, the boy's tears turned to laughter. And there is a picture of what we have through the gospel. Because on a far greater scale, this will be the experience of every child of God, with God as our Father, our perspective all changes. Though we weep now, joy comes with the morning. Do you lack hope this evening? Have your afflictions caused you to forget the goodness of God? Well, look and grasp verses 22 to 23. The first thing, the first thing that preserves this man is the steadfast love of the Lord. That's what I want us to see first of all. God's love preserves us. Jeremiah's uh, hope is firmly rooted in who God is and how God acts towards us. And the A clause of verse 22 here says that the steadfast of the love of the Lord never ceases. As some versions say, his loving kindness or his, or his unfailing love or his loyal love. It's one of the, the greatest words 
in our Bibles, one of the most common words in the Old Testament, which ultimately refers to God's covenant-keeping love, God's hesed. And as an Old Testament Jew, well, in the ancient Near East, Jeremiah would have been all too familiar with that divine covenant that we've been reminded of this afternoon that was made with Noah and then Abraham and then Israel and then David. The, the, the record had been faithfully passed down the generations and in the depths of Jeremiah's depression, the thing that keeps him going is covenant theology, isn't it? And I'm not going to say much more about that because I don't want to steal Sam's thunder. But that is the first truth that brings comfort to his troubled soul. He calls this to mind. He reminds himself that in covenant love, God has pledged that he would be their people. He would be their God and they would be his people. And and therefore he'll be preserved. He's indestructible spiritually. And God will not abandon him in his pain but will walk with him. But you know that just as God made a covenant with him, so he makes a covenant with us. And we are here in 2022, uh, alive and well, because God's love never once ceased. He, He sometimes allows us to taste the consequences of our rebellion, but his love is steadfast. It does not fail us in our darkest hour and in our time of deepest need. But it is steadfast. It's not a circumstantial, but it's a, it's a dependable love. There was once a man who was shipwrecked at sea. And the whole crew had been lost. But he had been washed up upon the rocks. And although his strength had almost vanished and his hope had almost faded away, he somehow found the strength to cling to those rocks for dear life. And at sunrise, as the rescue unit was launched and desperately searched for survivors, they found this one resilient, shivering man in the midst of the sea, clinging to the rocks for dear life. And they quickly pulled him to safety and they quizzed him about his ordeal. And the man replied, as I shivered and wept all night and wondered whether I would ever make it through, the rock never moved. And that is the reason for our hope, isn't it? That's the believer's perspective in pain when we're in the darkness of the night and it feels as though we're simply clinging to the rocks. We we call this to mind that the morning light is coming. Rescue is on its way. We will not be consumed but by God's steadfast love we will be preserved and pulled one day to heavenly shores where our song will forever be the rock never moved. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll fastened to the rock which cannot move grounded firm and deep in the saviour's love but things are taken a step further as we enter into verse 22 his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning that's the second thing that keeps jeremiah afloat god's mercies are unfailing Uh, One of the defining marks of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is that he showed mercy for sinners. The disabled, the despised, the disappointments, the dregs of society found this abundant supply of mercy in the person of Jesus Christ. And in verses 22 to 23, Jeremiah has grasped something about God that so many seem to forget in the midst of suffering. And that is that God's mercies, plural, are both novel and they are constant every single day. They are new and they are there every morning. When we got out of bed this morning, before we drove up to Cary, we were immediately presented with a a new opportunity to experience fresh outpourings of the mercy of God. And you can just think back all the way to uh, the early Old Testament as the Israelites are wandering through the wilderness and how they were specifically instructed not to carry over the manna to the next day because God would provide. Each and every morning, fresh bread was there on their doorstep. And that's... That's the experience of every true believer spiritually. 
And so physically it is true as well, isn't it? We don't need to join the rest of the nation in panic buying toilet roll like we were doing in 2020 or panic buying petrol like we were doing just last year. But we can say that we have Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides in any and every circumstances, every morning he will provide. There's there's nothing stingy about our God, is there? But physically and spiritually, we do not need to live off yesterday's mercy and love, but each and every day we're topped up to the full, aren't we? To the point that we say like David, my cup overflows. Who in the world could make you an offer like this? I can't, you can't, but God does. People change, their promises can be broken, but not our God. His love and his mercy endure for all time. They don't fluctuate and, and rise and fall, but they are, they are constant. They're steadfast. God's love and his mercy. But then finally, we come to the bottom line of verse 23. Great is your faithfulness. That's the third thing that brings hope to this man. God's faithfulness is great. Notice how in that same verse, Jeremiah shifts from speaking about God to speaking directly to God. And and really when he says faithfulness, he, he simply means if God said it, he will do it. You can bet on it. I remember reading at some point somewhere when I was younger and it's stuck with me uh, until now, this quotation, never doubt in the dark what you know to be true in the light. Never doubt in the dark what you know to be true in the light. And uh, maybe you've grasped something of God's faithfulness before, but, but now you've become skeptical in the darkness. On the good days we get it, but on the bad days we forget it. But may I challenge you, can you sing in any and every circumstance the words of this weeping prophet? Great is your faithfulness. Does that thrill your heart as you come to Kiri? As you contemplate the new year, as you work in an often unappreciated role in the church that you have been called to serve in. A few years ago, my wife had been badgering me, saying, can we go to Paris? It's romantic, it's beautiful, you're going to love it. And I finally gave in, and what's the first thing you do when you go to Paris? Well, it's, for most of us, it's straight to the Eiffel Tower, one of the most visited monuments in the world. And I remember as we stood with the tower looming Uh, Hundreds of meters over us and thousands of sightseers uh, were surrounding us. Well, everybody's cameras were out and people were fighting for the best spot to get their shots. It really wasn't much of a challenge to spot the tourists. But I remember, and I'll never forget the the conversation I had with a, with a, a dear African brother on the steps leading down to the tower. He was a believer and we got speaking about that. But then he said to me this. He said, when you've been here for 25 years, well, the excitement soon wears off. For him, it was only his employment that kept him there. Day in, day out, there he was, same place, same posture. His back turned from the very thing that everybody else was so enamored by. He'd seen it a million times. He'd grown accustomed to its beauty and the wonder was gone. Friends, may this not be true of us with God. May we never lose our wonder or grow accustomed to his love or over familiar with his mercies or unmoved by his great faithfulness that our mouths stop singing and our hearts grow cold within us. Christian believer, whatever sphere of service that you are engaged in, whatever season of life you find yourself this evening, at the beginning of this new year, I challenge you, to call this to mind. These are, these are not psychological tricks to help us through the darkness of grief. These are not abstract theological doctrines to be approved of, but they are anchors for the soul. There's something to cling to as we sail through the Cape of Storms. The solution for Jeremiah is really the solution for each of us this evening. His perspective is the perspective that we must have as we encounter inevitable difficulty. I am the man who has seen affliction, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Amen. Let's pray. 
loving, merciful and faithful God, we come before your throne of grace acknowledging that we are so very faithless by nature and yet astounded at the mercy of Jesus Christ and the grace that he has poured into each of our lives. And we do pray, Lord God, that through the rest of this conference, through the rest of this year, and for the rest of our lives, we would be prepared to sing your praises, knowing that you have given us something to cling to in the present and something that can never be taken away in the future. Oh, Father, we pray that you would be with us for the remainder of this evening. In Christ's precious name. Amen.